At a wedding in the town of Cana, Jesus miraculously turned water into wine. But why? Find out today, as we look at John 2 1 12. Lord, as we come before your word, we ask for your help. Help that we might see the glory of who Jesus is. We pray this in his name. Amen. If you've ever been to a foreign country where you don't know the language, perhaps you've had an experience like I had. I had uh, gotten off the plane, and there were some kind people there who then led me from the plane to the train station, got me on the right train, and, and off I went into the city. And they even sat with me on the train. They even told me, okay, this is your stop. Time to get off. You know, and they, they got me off of the train. All I had to do was walk outside of the train station. And there at the curb, people were waiting to pick me up. But I had a problem. All around me were these signs, and I couldn't read one of them. Everyone was in some other language, and I was in serious trouble. It's a very humbling moment when you're like, what, what, where am I going? And so several attempts of following this and talking to people, I eventually made it out. And it was so difficult for me because I failed to read the signs. Now, I want us to step up, go a bit farther and think with me. Imagine a world in which there are no signs, not just signs you can't read, but there just aren't any to begin with. Without signs, you wouldn't know what the food costs at a store. You wouldn't be able to navigate your way through the hospital to go visit a sick friend. You'd most likely get lost driving in unfamiliar places. The truth is our our life is filled with signs and we're regularly dependent upon them. Signs provide us with information. They guide us to our destination. Think with me about how ridiculous it would be if I were on a road trip with my family. Say we're heading down to Florida. We're going to visit Panama City Beach. And as we're driving, we, we finally, I mean, hours and hours, we finally get to the sign that says Panama City Beach, 98 miles. Imagine I were to pull the van over and get out and open the back of the van and get out my beach chair and sit down and kind of motion to the sign and say, isn't Panama City Beach great? Not only would my children and all the people driving by think I'm crazy, but there would be a profound sense of dissatisfaction. Dad, this isn't it, (laughs) right? We're not intended to stop at the sign. The signs, they point beyond themselves to, to the reality. And the Bible is actually filled with signs. And they do the same thing. They point us to ultimate reality. The signs that are found within the scripture, they point us to spiritual truth. A great example is that of the Exodus. God performed signs and wonders through his servant Moses. And he did so, you can think of all the the plagues and his staff. I mean, there's so many of these miraculous events. God did these things to authenticate Moses as God's messenger. And likewise, to authenticate his message as being from God. Well, there's also signs in the Gospel of John. We're going through a series in John's Gospel, and today we come to the first of these signs. Like the signs you see on the highway, and the signs in John's Gospel point beyond themselves to something greater. These signs are not the destination, but they give us directions to this great truth of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. These signs point us to the reality that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So as we progress through John's gospel, I pray that we won't just see these signs, but rather we will be directed to the reality that they represent, to that which they signify. So listen now as I read from John chapter 2, the first of Jesus' signs, the wedding and the wine. This is the word of the Lord, God's holy, perfect, and errant, and infallible word. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. 
Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with waters, with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, they went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Now, if we were to read that story and say, wow, Jesus turned water into wine, and then go home, we would be stopping at the sign. You see, what we're supposed to do is figure out what this signifies. What's the point? So again, look at verse 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed him. So what reality does this event point us towards? In what way does this occurrence reveal the glory of Jesus? Let's start by noting the context. We've moved into a new section in John's gospel. The first half of the book contains seven signs that Jesus performed. Now, he performed a lot more than that, but John focuses in on a few here. This is the beginning of this public ministry of Jesus. And within that first half of the book of John, there's a smaller unit that we're starting today. It's chapters 2 through 4. Now, your Bible might have headings that say, you know, the wedding at Cana or something else. And you have chapter headings and verse numbers. None of those things are original to the text. This was just one flowing, long document. So John, to mark out units, he had to structure his text with things that he included. He loved to to bracket things, to use repetition to show us, okay, here these things go together and these things go together. Well, that's what he's done here in chapters 2 through 4. He brackets this section with two signs, two signs that both take place in the same place at Cana, and in both of them, we're told that people believed. So let me show you quickly. So chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Then now flip over to chapter 4, verse 46. This is the last in this section. It says, so he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water Wine. So there's this this coming back. Back in chapter 2, verse 11, it's concluded with these words. This was the first of his signs that he did in Galilee. He manifested his glory. His disciples believed. And then over again in chapter 4, when we get to verse 53, we read this. The father knew that it was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son shall live. That's the end of the story. And then we read this. And he believed, he and his household, verse 44, and this was the second sign that Jesus did when he came from Judea to Galilee. So what's going on here? He's bracketing this section with this similar material. It happens at the same place. It's this sign. People believe. And within that are these different stories. And each one of them tells us about something new. And at the very middle of this big section, John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the bridegroom. Now that will be significant. In the midst of this whole unit, Jesus is teaching us and John is helping us to see it about the new creation that is arriving in Jesus. Each one of these stories has something to do with something that's new. So here we have the new wine of the kingdom. There's the new temple, the new birth. There's new living water. There's a new kind of worship. It doesn't matter where it is. It matters that it's in spirit and truth. 
So as we look at this text, we're trying to figure out what it signifies. We start by saying, okay, what is new here that's being revealed to us? Now, what happens in the scene is as simple and straightforward as it is profound and thought-provoking. So Jesus is at this wedding, and they run out of wine. His mother points out that fact. He gives his mother a, a kind of a cryptic, weird answer, maybe, maybe some correction there. But then Jesus gives instruction to fill these jars, and so they fill it up. And then he says, now take what you filled and, and give it to the, to the host. The host drinks it and recognizes that this is wine. This is the best of wine. And he goes and he, he commends its excellence to the bridegroom. And then John tells us that this was the first of his signs. That he showed his glory and that people believed. But this morning I want us to think about what does this point us towards? Why is it here? So let's walk through it slowly. Look again in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee. Now, why does John tell us it's on the third day? Well, because this this is a historical account. In in the chapter before, he he described four days. And now he's saying, now it's been three days later, and he's telling us that now this happened. So that's why it says on the third day. And yet, perhaps there's some foreshadowing here going on. Because the next story, again, we're told that Jesus will rebuild the temple that is destroyed, which is his body, in three days. There seems to be this reference towards something coming. Now, Christians know that Jesus was resurrected from the dead on the third day. And that's not just something that happens right here. This symbolism happens again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. There's these significant third days. Let me give you some examples. So in Genesis 22, Abraham's going to sacrifice his son. And we read that on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place. And it was on the third day that this substitutionary sacrifice was provided so that Isaac could live. In Exodus, right before the giving of the Ten Commandments, this is Exodus 19, verse 11, we read this. Be ready For the third day, for on the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. So we have this substitute on the third day. We have Israel entering into a covenant with God on the third day. In Joshua chapter 3, it's at the end of three days, the text tells us, that the people prepared to cross the Jordan. In 2 Kings 20, Hezekiah gets sick. And Isaiah comes and declares the word of the Lord to him, that the Lord will raise him on the third day. In Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 we read, and on the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. So again and again we just keep hearing this and again they're historically accurate. These things just happen on the third day but it's interesting that the Bible keeps pointing them out to us again and again. Jonah was in the deep for three days. Later Jesus says that this is a sign pointing to him. That he indeed will be in the deep for three days and three nights. Esther went before the king as an advocate on the third day. All of these significant third days anticipate the greatest third day in all of history. So important is this that Paul writes these words. They were read for us earlier from 1 Corinthians 15. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also receive, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, maybe you haven't thought about it, but where in the Old Testament is it prophesied that the Messiah will rise on the third day? Here, Paul says he he rose from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. But there is no explicit statement, no prophecy that tells us exactly that that's going to happen. Rather, there are these foreshadowing events. There are these hints, and Paul picks up on this. He says, we should have known. That's what John is doing here. He's pointing us forward to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Look again at our text. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So secondly, let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus choose to perform his first sign 
at a wedding. Does that matter? The sign is not merely turning water into wine. It's turning water into wine at a wedding. Remember that Jesus is soon to be called the bridegroom. We're supposed to catch this upon the second reading through the gospel. You see, part of the symbol, part of the picture, part of the sign is the wedding celebration. So we see his glory in the third day, and we also see his glory in the wedding. Now, our culture and government have distorted what a wedding is, what marriage is. Even though Americans are confused and fuzzy on this issue, the Bible is crystal clear. Marriage is the union of one man and one woman for life. That's it. That means that two men can't get married. Two women can't be married to one another. God made men to marry women. That's it. The idea of so-called same-sex marriage is a contradiction in terms. It's not a reality. It's a facade. It's a lie. This is an attempt at a bait and switch. And many in our culture are going for it. But if I were to go to the, the Louvre and they're fined, Mona Lisa, and then get, get something and pry off the label, and then go take that label for Mona Lisa and, and affix it to a trash can, that doesn't now make the trash can a masterpiece. It doesn't make it a work of art. It doesn't become Mona Lisa. And just because our culture has attached a new title upon a perversity does not make it marriage. All right, why am I going on about this? Not just because the Bible is really clear on this, but because when we distort marriage, we actually distort an important symbol, a sign of the gospel. Weddings and marriage are part of how the Bible describes our relationship with Jesus. Jesus accomplished much in his sacrificial death. He laid down his life for his bride, we are told. Jesus is the ideal bridegroom. If you look in Ephesians 5, we are told how Marriage exists primarily so that we will understand the union between Christ and his church. That means every marriage on the planet is a little picture pointing us towards the relationship of Christ with the church. He will never leave us nor forsake us. We dare not manipulate this image. Now, back to our passage. Jesus is at a wedding, and that's important. Look at verse 3. The wine ran out. And the mother of Jesus said to him, we have no wine. Running out of wine was a big deal. This could bring shame upon the family. This could give them a bad reputation. Now, whose responsibility was it to have enough provision for the party? Well, in that culture, it was the groom. It wasn't the father or the mother. No, no, no. The groom, he would prepare for this wedding. And so he would gather all the provisions necessary to throw this massive feast that wouldn't just be a couple hours, but most times would last multiple days. The, the, the whole community, the village would be invited. This was a huge thing. And to run out of the provisions was massive. In fact, it was so intense that uh, in their day, the parents of the bride, they could file a lawsuit if he failed to have enough provisions for the event. I mean, this is no little thing. This groom is in trouble. The wine has run out. And we read in the text that the mother of Jesus says they have no wine. This isn't Mary sharing the latest gossip. And it's not just informational. Oh, Jesus, did you know they're out of wine? I think this is much more like when your wife says, the grass needs cutting. Right? There's, there's this implicit reply there. She's looking to Jesus in hopes that he can solve the problem. Something needs to be done here. Now, I doubt that she was expecting her son to work a miracle. Again, this is his first son. He hadn't done any yet. And yet, she has looking to him as one who's responsible, saying, surely something can be done. When trouble comes in your life, when figuratively speaking, the wine is run out, when you're empty-handed and all that you've planned isn't enough, do you turn to Jesus like Mary did? She has utter confidence in the Savior. May we follow in her footsteps. It's interesting that the text doesn't mention her by name, perhaps to draw attention away from her and towards Christ. Some would elevate Mary, but here she's shown to be 
just one of us. And I think that's part of what we see in Jesus' response. Here is this opportunity he's given to show compassion, to meet a real need. But we can be a little confused by the jarring response that we see for Jesus in verse 4. So look there again with me. Again, she just said, hey, they're out of wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not come. There's three things we need to deal with there. First, woman. He called her woman. Now, this is actually an appropriate title. This is like saying ma'am or madam. It's not like a, a taxi cab driver that says, all right, where to, lady? No, he's not speaking that abruptly. But we should note that this isn't nearly as intimate as saying mama or mother. He just refers to her generally. I don't think he's disrespecting his mother, but he is distancing. He's showing that there's something that has changed. And there is a mild correction here. You could translate what Jesus says here as, why do you involve me? There's something about the play on the relationship. Why would you bring me into this? And I think as his public ministry is beginning, Jesus is pointing out that their relationship is fundamentally changing. No matter who you are, you have to come to Jesus the same way as a sinner in need of a savior. Yes, he is her son, but ultimately he needs to be her Lord. Now we have to deal with this last bit. What is it about him saying, hey, they want out of Ryan, that he says this. He says, my hour has not yet come. That seems a bit odd. Well, interestingly, he keeps mentioning his hour again and again and again throughout the book. It's kind of a guide on our journey. We keep hearing about his hour. Let me give you a few examples. In John chapter 7, we read these words. This is John 7 verse 30. They were seeking to arrest him. So they want to kill Jesus. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So even though they want to arrest him, John just says, the truth is they couldn't. It wasn't his time yet. It was beyond their control. His hour had not yet come. There's a similar statement like this in chapter 8. Eventually we get to chapter 12 at the triumphal entry. Jesus comes. He's preparing to die, to be the perfect Passover lamb who dies in the place of others. And we read that the the nations finally come. Gentiles come and they want to talk to Jesus. And now that it's clear that his ministry has gone global, Jesus says these words. This is John 12, verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come. He's there. He's focused upon the cross. His hour is his suffering and his death, his crucifixion. This is the pinnacle of history. This is the moment, the time, the hour. When the perfect son of God becomes sin and dies in the place of sinners so that we might become righteousness. The hour has come and this is the reason that Jesus even came to earth. It's even spelled out more for us in the next chapter. Here's John 13 verse 1. This is the beginning of the upper room discourse. This is the night before he dies. He's gathered with his disciples. This is what we read first. Now, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Jesus knows, oh yes, my hour has come. And notice, it's not just his death, but it's his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. All of this, this is in view as his hour, his moment. Here at the beginning of his public ministry, back in Canaan, Jesus is laser focused on why he came. He's focused on the gospel, on the cross. And he reveals his glory here as the path to the cross, his greater glory. Now, with all this in view, we really should answer the question that Jesus asked. He says, what does this have to do with me? What does turning water into wine at a wedding have to do with Jesus and the cross? Well, we'll come back to that. Look at verse 5. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. This is a statement of faith. She has received the rebuke from Jesus, and yet she's comfortable to leave it in his hands. All right, his hour doesn't come, whatever, but just do what he says. No one has ever actually received better advice in all of history. Do what Jesus says. So then John quickly narrates the story. So look at verse 6. 
Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. So you put that together, that's 120 to 180 gallons of water. This is a lot, especially when we know it's about to become wine. All right, verse 7. He said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. Of course, he calls the bridegroom because he's the one responsible. It's his wine, right? Verse 10, he said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then they bring out the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Did you notice how understated this miraculous sign is? It's there in verse 9. It's just the water now become wine. There's no hocus pocus, no magic words, no waving of the hands. We don't read that Jesus touched the water or he prayed to the Father. He just willed it into existence. There's power on display. Without any outward sign, Jesus was able to transform one substance into another. He just willed the wine into existence. So we see his glory in his power. Now, we should note two things about this wine. Number one, the lavish supply. Think about how much people pay for a bottle of wine, right? Maybe it's a cheap bottle. It might be five bucks, but a, but a fancy bottle, a good bottle. I mean, they're going to pay a good amount there. We're talking about over 100 gallons of wine. This was, this was massive provision. It's a lavish supply. And we should note the quality of the wine. He says, this is the best. This is the good stuff. This is interesting. Here we see that Jesus created good wine, the best of wine. Well, what is it that makes wine so good? What raises the value? Well, there's a variety of variables, but one of the main ones is the age of the wine, right? Jesus, he he made the dusty bottle that's filled with the good stuff. He created old, mature wine. This is significant because if you think back to Genesis, this is how God created the world. Adam and Eve were not created as babies. They were created as mature adults, ready for reproduction and marriage. And it wasn't just Adam and Eve. It was actually all of creation. The the garden was was there. The the animals, they're going. Was it the chicken or the egg? Well, the Bible tells us it's the chicken, right? These things are, are made mature. And here, Jesus is identifying himself as the creator, as the one who makes that which is old. Now, at this point, there are those who get frustrated with this text. There are those who don't like what it says here. There are some who just outright deny that this ever happened. But interestingly, you see this on on opposite ends of the spectrum. So you see this among theological liberals, those who would deny the supernatural, who don't think miracles happen. They look at this and say, well, that can't have happened. It's not possible. This has to be some mistake. There must have been a little bit of wine left at the bottom, but that's not what those jars were for. I mean, they're, they're all the weird excuses that people have come up to try to explain it away don't make any sense. But on the other end of the spectrum, there are those who are theologically conservative, those who are very traditional who say, well, Jesus couldn't have possibly made wine. No, not wine. I mean, he could turn the water into anything else, just not alcohol, right? But we have to respect the text for what it actually says. Jesus turned water into wine. Just as is it impossible to remove the miraculous elements from Jesus' life, so it is impossible to remove wine from the life of Jesus. So next we see his glory in the wine. We see his glory in the wine. You see, Jews saw wine as a gift of God. In Psalm 104, we learn that this is what makes the heart glad. Here's a, Psalm 104, verse 15. Wine gladdens the heart of men. Now, the Bible's really clear that drunkenness is forbidden. But just because of the possibility of abuse does not require disuse. Now, many people choose not to drink alcohol, and that's an appropriate, a good choice. The Bible never says that to drink wine is actually sinful. And so we have to be careful not, not, not to push too much upon the text. We have to recognize it for what it says. 
This really happened. Jesus was at a wedding when they ran out of wine, and he made more wine, a lavish supply that would allow the party, the celebration, to keep going. Again, what does this have to do with Jesus? What is this sign teaching us? Well, Jesus, he did what the bridegroom failed to do. He brought out a new supply of better wine. He provided abundant wine at this wedding. Now, this is the first sign. And in it, Jesus is declaring a new age, the dawning of a new epic. By turning water into wine at this wedding, Jesus is announcing the beginning of the messianic age. The Messiah has come. Just listen to some of the Old Testament prophecies describing what's going to happen when the Messiah comes. Here's a couple. Isaiah 25, verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-aged wine, of food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. This is part of the coming of the Savior. Or listen to Amos chapter 9, verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowmen shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grace, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel that they may rebuild the cities and inhabit them, that they may plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall have gardens and eat their fruit. So Jesus begins his public ministry with a celebration, with a party. This is a signal of the new messianic age. And it's fitting that he performed this sign at a wedding. Because marriage is this analogy of Christ and the church. He is the perfect, the ideal bridegroom. And we, those who trust in Jesus, are his bride. Jesus has come to start the party. He's come to bring about this celebration. You know, at the Last Supper, Jesus gave wine He had a new significance. He made it a symbol of his life-giving blood. He said it was the new covenant. And so redemption of Christ was foreshadowed in this sign here at the beginning of his ministry. Let's also note, why is John tell us about these jars? He doesn't just tell us the size. He points out that they're jars that were used for purification. We saw that back in verse 6. There were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. So these jars, the water that was in it, it was used to bring about a temporary cleansing, a purity. But Jesus, through his blood that's symbolized in wine, he brings about a perfect, eternal purity. He makes us new. He makes us clean. Lastly, we see his glory in the celebration. Not just the party that was there that day, but the party that it anticipates. You see, the real party is yet to come. Remember, all of these signs, they point us forward. Well, what is this ultimately pointing us forward to? The Bible describes the consummation of the ages as a wedding feast. Part of what this anticipates is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is pointing us in the sign to the ultimate marriage between Christ and the church. So with all this in view, How do we answer the question? What does this have to do with Jesus? Turning water into wine at a wedding. What has everything to do with Jesus? It seems that every step, every point of what was going on here is somehow symbolically pointing to what Jesus is all about. He was revealing his glory and helping people to believe. C.S. Lewis said this, God doesn't do parlor tricks. Now, he said that to point out that God doesn't work a miracle just to impress us, just to make us go, wow, right? That's that's not the point. God is doing it for a particular purpose, and he has a particular response in mind. Did you notice what happens at the end of verse 11? He manifested his glory, and his disciples believed him. Well, the same is true of you. God actually expects for you to see his glory and for you to Believe in Jesus, to put your trust in the Son of God. Believers are granted here the privilege that Moses longed for. Back in chapter 1, verse 14, we read these words. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld his glory. We have seen his glory. And here the first sign is one of the times in which it's shown. See his glory. It was obvious. It was clear. It was seen. What about you? Do you see his glory? Are you in awe of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished on your behalf? If you're a Christian, God calls you to see his glory and give him worship. To confidently trust in Jesus, to eagerly await the marriage supper of the Lamb. He calls us to rejoice and to celebrate. Just as Jesus transformed water into something new, Jesus coming as the Messiah has come to bring about something new in us. We are his new creation. We sang it earlier. Listen again to this promise that Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17, he says this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, we are part of the new that he is bringing about. Now, if you're here and you're not a Christian, this sign points you to embrace your only hope for change. You see, the truth is, you are spiritually dead outside of Christ. And you have no more chance of changing your nature than that water could change itself into wine. You need Christ to change you. And he can. He makes all things new, even you. Will you trust in him today? Will you be made new? Will you come to him for pardon? Will you come to him that you might be purified? That you might come to the celebration that will have no end. If you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus, I would love to talk to you after the service. I'm in no hurry. This sign points us all to the wonder of who Jesus is. He is the Messiah who inaugurated a new age. He has come to save sinners and give us an incredible reason to celebrate. He is the loving bridegroom who in his hour laid down his life for his bride. He's the one who on the third day rose victorious from the grave. This sign points us forward to the day in which we will celebrate with him forever. That day we will see an even greater glory. Now John, he wrote other books in the New Testament. He wrote the last one, the book of Revelation. John also writes these words in chapter 19, verse 9. Blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Let this sign point us all to the glory of Jesus. May you believe it. May you put your trust in him. Let's pray together. Lord, we are humbled at what you came to accomplish. And even in the ways in which you foreshadowed your work again and again and again, you've shown us what you came to do and you have done it. You have accomplished what we could not accomplish. You have made us pure by becoming filth in our place. You have made us righteous by becoming sin in our place. Oh, how we rejoice in the work of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your kindness, for your love in sending him. And Spirit, we rejoice that you come and you change our hearts. Lord, we do have reason to celebrate Lord, may we all drink the wine of the kingdom, that which is symbolized by the very blood of Christ. Lord, we thank you that he died in our place, that we can have life. Lord, may this celebration, may this glorious truth so grip us that we cannot help but share this news with others. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.